Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I'm just saying it's great to be back with colleagues in a room as well as have uh, people joining us as well uh, remotely. Um, I suppose partly because um, for our own well-being, connecting other people is really important. And um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about now, I suppose, is about connection um, and connecting across the community, the school community um, and outside of it as well. Um, just to uh, uh, give you a, a sense of some context, I suppose, um, context for me and context for, the, for this talk. Um, I, uh, I've been at Queen Margaret's now for three years. I joined in September 2019, um, very much thinking that I would uh, use the uh, leadership st structures and models that I've read and the things that Asa was talking about earlier on, um, and then finding myself really in the second term uh, working out how to shut a school down for a pandemic um, and, and move um, our international borders uh, to a place of safety that luckily we did actually get them all home on place there to the right parts of the world. Um, but thinking about our international uh, girls, thinking about our regional girls, our national and so on. So there's a lot to think about. And sometimes uh, in that, and I suppose I've emerged from that three years later, um, certainly with um, some badges for leadership, but also thinking to myself, uh, if only I'd had the chance to do the modelling. But actually, um, there is a great deal that goes on in our schools where I think we, we don't necessarily theorise it, but we do end up doing some great work. And the work that we did, this is a case study, and it is just about how the work we did in wellbeing, which started in the pandemic and started in lockdown, was really part of and fed out of our culture um, and ethos, and then has helped develop our culture and ethos be developed um, post pandemic. Um, before I was uh, head at Queen Margaret, so I was the pastoral deputy at the Royal Grammar School in Newcastle. So a very different school, big day school, co-ed, um, very different challenges. And I think therefore the context is, is quite important. Um, but actually, this is not the most controversial thing we're ever going to hear about. You know, we all know well-being is important. We all know that um, that it's, that it's an important part of what we do. And actually we see that in the new inspection framework as well, that we've just touched on. You know, the, the well-being of the, of the children in our care is at the center of everything that we do. Um, for me, as a teacher, because ultimately I still see myself as one, even though I do very little of it in the classic sense of being in the classroom. Um, Emotional health is at the centre of everything else that we do in a school, because you, could put a, you can put a child, regardless of age, in front of the best teacher in the world, um, and they will not get the best out of that lesson or that teacher if their head is not in the game. If they haven't walked into the classroom um, ready to learn, feeling happy in themselves, feeling comfortable in, in who they are, feeling ready um, to take on the challenges that they're going to be presented with in that lesson in that classroom. So um, without the emotional well-being stuff going on well in the background, the rest of it isn't going to come as you would like. So for me, it really it has always been at the heart. It really does matter. Um, and I suppose in terms of leading a school, um, making sure that our language is about every, everybody having responsibility for well-being and having responsibility for everybody's well-being. So in terms of embedding a culture in school, or developing a culture in school. I mean, it isn't somebody else's job, nor is anyone's well-being not your responsibility. So um, that includes the staff, it includes uh, um, the um, students, it includes the support staff, it even includes the head teacher. Um, everybody is talking about uh, well-being because it's everybody's responsibility. And I think post-COVID, um, it's even more important that we have that embed, embedding of, uh, in terms of leadership, in terms of working through what it is we want in our schools to support these children. Um, we've got a generation of young people whose development was not what we or they or their parents expected. Um, we may well, I think as adults, think we've got over COVID, we've got over the lockdowns, you know, we remember the some of the some of the vagaries of it, some of the high, some of the lows, but children were still developing, and their development didn't stop just because they were in the lockdown or they were in front of a screen or they were prevent 
prevented from playing sport with other children because they were in different bubbles. They carried on developing and we can't reverse that. As adults we can, we can kind of understand what it was that happened to us, but for children that's not the case. So we have to look again at how we support children to develop emotionally, given that they have already developed differently as a result of their pandemic experience. Um, and that has also been very much in the forefront of the culture that we've, we've developed at, at Queen Margaret. And at Queen Margaret, um, you could actually just sit here and think, my goodness, how could she even talk about this? She's from a small school. I've got 230 girls. Um, it's all girls, so I have, so how can this be relevant to boys? Um, and we're a boarding school, so we have day, we have girls who are day girls. Most of them stay quite late because they like to be with their friends, so they're still there at seven o'clock at night, but they are not sleeping with us. Um, so how, how is this relevant? But I suppose the point is, is that um, it is relevant when you think about the context of your own school, which will be different for everybody. But when you ask what is emotional well-being, um, I googled this, this is what I got. Well, oh yeah, it's all the usuals, you know, we could all, if only I could do that, top right. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been out to <laughs> um, you know, Self-care, um, some of the issues to do with, men, with mental health, um, eating well, thinking about diets, thinking about um, the emotion, your emotional wellness, being aware, all of those things matter to every child and every person in your in your school in some way so it will vary in your context if you were a, a prep school much younger children the approach may well be different but the issues are the same um, and so um, in looking at in giving you an idea of what we did at queen margaret so i'm very aware that it's a case study for us but, it, but i hope there'll be threads that come from, for you and how and how you can think about uh, moving emotional health and well-being on in your school. When we um, thought about well-being, one of the things that we that we thought of quite clearly, and we were kind of reviewing where we were with it, was um, what does it mean. And actually, what was really clear as we began to talk about it and talk to our girls about it and talk to our parents about it, and I'll come on to that in a minute a bit more, was that there are different, different things to different people. And the biggest stumbling block to an effective well-being culture in a school, in my view, is making an assumption that um, you know what well-being looks like for the, for your, for the children in your school. Um, because Adolescents and adults, and I'll use that example because I've got teenagers in my school, um, have different views. So for adolescents, you say, what is well-being? What does it mean to you? Well, to them, it means those things. There's been some studies, if you want to kind of Google it and look it up, there's a number of studies that have looked at this as well. Um, I think I am, my emotional well-being is fine when I'm having fun. That's a real, that's great. That's, that's what you'd expect and hope that children would say. Um, that I feel safe, that I'm being kind, I'm being helpful, and that's happening to me as well. Um, and that I am able to uh, do things for myself, self-efficacy, and particularly the teenagers we see that. And what was really clear, though, in the study and in the things that we were seeing from our students was that the idea of being a satisfaction when I'm pleased with what I've done is actually quite a peripheral thing for them. They want, that wasn't what they use as an interpretation of their well-being and their wellness. Um, if you contrast that to adults, adults have similar but not the same. So we think, uh, well, um, we, our well-being is good because our relationships are working well, that, our, that we've got this good, you know, we're engaged in our lives, that we uh, feel very positive. And I suppose for a child, they may say having fun is the, is the same thing. So there are, diff there are similarities, but there are also differences. But for me, the satisfaction, we talk a lot about, you know, what's the meaning and purpose of our lives? Do we have that sense of meaning and purpose? Do we have that sense of equilibrium, you know, work-life balance? We talk about those things. Um, but for children, they talk about it in a different way. So if you are looking to develop um, um, well-being strategies and, and uh, within your school that work for your children, 
bottom line is you have to know what it is the children need. And it may not be what you think. So for um, younger children, it may be that you, um, that they, they need to play more. For older children, for, for teenagers and senior schools, um, I would argue that we perhaps need to think a little bit more about, about how we give them opportunities for self-efficacy, that we give them opportunities to, 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 to be adult in a safe, in a safe way, to take, to take ownership of, of, their, of their learning and so on, and, and be very open about that. Um, but it, it's a real challenge because if you have, um, if you start looking at what does well-being mean to the people in my, to the, to the constituencies in my school, then suddenly you have a very multi-layered approach that's quite complicated. So taking this further, we uh, think about what the children think is uh, important for their emotional well-being, but Culturally, if a school has got it right, you're also caring about the adults in your school. Well, they want the stuff on the right. And within your and within the, the staff body in your school, um, some of those things will matter more than others, depending on their background, on their job, on their income. Um, and if we are committed as a school to wellness, then we have to be as committed to, to the right as we are to the left. Um, because the right deliver the left, the adults deliver the, the, yeah, the children's well, well-being within the school, but the children's well-being helps the adults to feel better. So it has to be both ways. Um, and there's the challenge. Um, and I'm not going to say for one minute that um, any school, mine included, can get that right all the time. But knowing the challenge is half the battle. Um, because you because, because then you're always talking about it in the same way that you might put um, you know, strategic aims onto your onto your SLT agendas and you know, clear action points and so on. Uh, where does well-being and where does wellness come in that? And when does that, <coughs> does that conversation happen at senior level, at middle leadership level, as well as in classrooms and in corridors? Um, I suppose. So that when we ask, we dig down a bit further, then actually we find some more, um, some stronger guidelines of where we might help our, our young people. Um, I love the fact that, um, uh, where is it? It's the pet ownership, 14% of children <laughs> say, then one of the things that really helps them to be happy is having a pet. Now, they might not have one, but it's that no, notion that they can nurture and care and that, some, and that there's something there that's kind of for them. And it's almost like, you know, the dog's got my back. It's not like the dog can go into battle for the child, but somehow there is that connection. And, and again, I think, you know, 60% think positive family relationships are the most important thing. Well, yes. And we know that. And we develop that in our relationships with our parents. Um, and in boarding schools, we develop it in terms of our, if our family feel in a boarding school, which is so, so important. They, it's their second home. So whether a child is staying in boarding school, whether for, for one, one night a week or very occasionally or seven nights a week, it's still their second home. And so the relationships that they've got um, with the staff in boarding, but in the staff in general, and with, with their relationships with their parents at home are, are, are hugely important and need to knit together because the positive relationship is the biggest one single factor that makes them feel better about themselves. Um, I think in the independent sector, we, you know, we well know the importance of, of, of physical health and sport and so on and helping people feel better. Um, but notice also, and again, I think for girls schools, perhaps we see it more, um, positive friendships are really important and are really important. To, and, um, if you are in um, a girls' school, you have no, I found this by being in both, I understand this now. Um, you, you can't get away from the fact that, the, that it matters to girls how they are doing with their friends. They articulate it, they live it, they walk down the corridor. One day you see them walking down with, with two other girls, the next morning you see them walking down with two completely different girls. One morning they're walking down with a smile on the face, the other morning they're not, but they've made decisions about their, who they're with and the friends that they're with, and it can be that different. If we care about well-being, then that matters. <coughs> In a co-ed school, 
in my experience in a co-ed school. Um, we still see it, but we probably don't give it the same amount of, of, of time and understanding that perhaps it deserves. And I, was, and I would say that that was the case in my own role when I was in it when I was at RGS. So I got it as a woman, but actually it's different for girls and it's different for boys and boy friendships are different too. Um, and so if positive friendships are over 50% important for well-being, then our understanding of those friendships is important too. And how we what, how we invest time and how we invest effort in supporting young people, children, to make those friendships work is a really good investment in terms of their, of their well-being and their, and their mental health, and ultimately of how they then operate in a classroom together. Um, and at, what we've seen at, at Queen Margaret's uh, is how important the, the girls see um, the connections between year groups. So just thinking again about our experience in pandemic, um, we didn't have as happy a school as I would like because we were bubbled. The girls were used to and love being with older girls and younger girls. And it's that family feel, the big sister, little sister thing, or big brother, little brother. And when we were bubbled in year groups, they missed that. Um, and they said so. So we were taking the temperature a lot of the time. And, and we were hearing that quite consistently all the way through. So when we came out of all the restrictions, the very first thing we did was obviously on the first day of term, so last September, September 2021, uh, the first day of term, we had zero lessons. Uh, we had massive inflatables and a lot of foam. And uh, um, we, put the, we put the girls back, back into their vertical houses and basically had a huge house hunt competition all day. Once they got their timetables and they knew where they, uh, knew where they were going, then we spent the day um, making them jump through foam and go on space hoppers and be together. Um, and when we came back to discussing that with the school council, and we have a wellbeing council as well as a school council. When we talked with both of those, um, they, the first thing they said was of their agenda, um, of their um, interests, of their socioeconomic background, but giving them opportunities to find people to do those things. And that's really what a, a good wellbeing approach, I think, has. So, one of the things that I think we, that we had to consider, and I think it's true for most independent schools, is, is the socioeconomic issue. And I think even more so in the current climate. Um, we're gonna have, I think, increasingly more and more children in our schools who are worried about how things are going at home, worried about fees, can mum and dad pay the fees? They're not immune to, especially teenagers, they're not immune to the news, they hear it all. They understand how mortgages work. Um, and I think probably the younger ones think about my own daughter. She's um, in year seven now, but certainly, uh, you know, she was astute enough to understand the way through the pandemic. Some quite interesting conversations with her as a 10 year old. Um, but notice that for some of our students and perhaps some of our students on bursaries, um, it's slightly different. Comfort, being wealthy, being focused, having good values matters to them. So some of those things just go up the list a little bit when you ask them. So my question at the bottom here is this, my school need is diverse. One size cannot fit all. So where on earth do I start? Because you could argue that every single child should have, has their own path to well-being, dependent on so many factors, both inside and outside of school. Isn't a program a well-being program by its nature one, which requires everyone to join in. But how do you do that? Because the programme can't fit, you know, one side doesn't fit all. And that was our challenge, is our challenge actually. Um, because it's, an, because it's, a, it's a, a never end, it's a spectrum and it moves the whole time because the children move the whole time as they develop. So what you, when you think you've got a great, you know, we, you've seen in the, in the agenda, you know, we won the wellness board, well, that's great. It doesn't mean that we're still, if we just sit on our laurels, then, we're not providing the wellness we should be. And so it's a question for you and your leadership teams, I would argue. Um, how do we put together a programme which enables the diversity and the richness of our school community to benefit? So 
how you plan the initiative determines how successful the initiative will be, in my view. It's all about, it's all in the planning, it's all about thinking it through. Um, so what did we do? Well, we started off by asking the people that, that matter. We asked the students, what is it that you want? What is it that you think you need? What do you think we do well? What do you think we don't do well? It's sort of turning, as Asia was saying, turning over those stones and just kind of really thinking about what was going on underneath the bonnet. Um, asking the staff two questions though. What do the staff think the students need? But what do they need too? Because I also think I could have the best teacher in the world, but if the best teacher in the world is not happy and emotionally well, then they're not going to deliver the best for the students in the classroom. Um, and they found that really challenging, actually. So staff are very good. I mean, your staff will be the same. They're very good. Oh, I need this, I need that. And so, what do you need? I don't know, I'm all right. And I would uh, hazard a guess that quite often, if someone's ever turned to you, any of your senior leaders or your governors or anyone's turned to you as the leader, and said, but what is it that you need? You, like me, if I'm honest, work. Not about me, it's about anybody else. Because so that's leadership. You, you're the one who eats last. But um, actually, by saying, do you know what? I could do with some coaching. I could do with someone to talk to every, every half term as a head. That would really help me, my mental health wellness. Then you're empowering moving everything up another whole notch because you're role modeling what's good, what's good about mental health. So I had to do quite a lot of that with my staff because they were very much about it's girls, 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 but yes, it is, but you're not serving the girls if you're not looking after yourselves. Um, I asked the parents. <laughs> now, um, parents have a different, have an interesting bunch because they think they know their children really well. And they do. I'm a parent. I think I know my daughter's best, of course. Um, but they don't see their children in school. So there is a, often a dis disconnect between what they think they think their children need and what we see. Um, and of course, we had the, um, the interesting conundrum of parents being in our classrooms through the, in the last uh, couple of years through pandemic learning. Um, and, uh, you know, well, no, I know, I know that if I was in every maths lesson, Mrs. Bailey, I know <coughs> what it is she needs. Um, yeah. But um, what is it that you think we can do? And that was about asking the right questions, actually, of parents. And so rather than asking the parents, what does your daughter need? What do you think the school could do? It's like a different thing. Um, and a better conversation, because then it's, you know, there's, a, there's a realism about what it is that schools can and can't achieve. And that you work with parents, even in boarding, that's the case. Um, and there's some challenges if you've got um, um, parents who are 8,000 miles away, but they still want to be involved. And actually, one of the benefits of online is that you can have those conversations much easier than you ever had before. It's much more natural. Um, and finally, I suppose, in, the in terms of the bottom line of, the, of, of planning properly was adopting the positive mindset. Um, because there was a, a clear... Um, so what do we do about well-being in our school? Well, we have a school counsellor, we have a school nurse, we have this, we have that, we have things that, um, the safety nets. So when it goes wrong, this is what we do. And the shift is, was, um, what, how do we stop it getting to that point? Because yes, we do need those things. It is really important to have the, um, the, the, the safety net there and the specialisms there and the, the counsellor that the students can turn to and the staff can turn to actually school nurses and so on but wouldn't it be really good if that they didn't they weren't used quite so much so for us there was a very much a, a, a mind shift of well how do we what's the positive how do we promote positivity rather than waiting for the issues to arise um, and I often talk to parents about spidey sense, and I'm sure you all have it too, um, where you can walk through a school day in, day out, and you same children pass you by and you say hello and on you go. You don't think anything of it particularly. And then one day you walk past them, you say hello, and they hello, and they walk on and you think, hang on a minute, 
there's something. Um, and you don't know what it is. And you might stop and say, you're okay. Maybe this one's fine. And then we, in our school, we have a culture now because it's about, pod, about trying to work it out. Are you sure? Because asking twice, something I talk, talk to the girls a lot about actually, don't just say, how are you doing? How are you really? Asking twice. Um, there may be something on, actually have to, and you pick something up. Um, but 99% of the time, within 24 hours of that spider sense going off, um, there was something going on. And um, picking it up early meant that we were much more proactive um, and able to respond better at a lower level. So uh, if you're thinking about the initiative, what are your common themes within that? Ask those questions and then find your common themes and then you've got the, then you've got the start. At QM, these were ours. Um, family, we are, we talk a lot about being a family school. Um, because we're small, uh, because we are largely boarding, <coughs> um, there is that real sense that you can come into the family. Um, and that you're part of that and that is something that was very uh, it was lovely to have that reflected back in, in the things that we were we were hearing the friends issue again you know the idea of friendships for life a lot of our um, old migrations talk about friends for life but friendship is very important and um, the theme of listening can will you will you hear me um, and that came across in all the constituencies actually can you hear me i'm talking to you but are you listening because again, very straightforward, oh, this is an issue about, and actually isn't the, that isn't the issue, there's something else. Are you listening? Um, providing opportunity, the girls in particular felt that the opportunities they had to do all kinds of things, everything from kind of crochet to um, scuba diving, um, but it was the, but providing those opportunities was something that, that they really valued in terms of their wellness. It, it's, the, it's the sense that there's something more than what's here. Um, for girls, I think more than boys, perhaps, um, the words they use is like, oh, we just don't want teachers to add to the drama. So it's that sort of notion that they've had a falling out and um, or they, you know, there is an issue with mum or something, but they don't want you to, the first thing they say is, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't tell you, but I just don't want you to add to the drama. It's dramatic enough already. Adults get involved and it becomes something big and it isn't big. So they wanted reassurance and an approach that was undramatic um, and that was collaborative actually. Um, so that either the, they know what it is that they, that we're going to do to help, or we agree where we're going to, what we're going to do, if anything. And sometimes all the agreement is, is that we'll just keep talking, but don't add to the drama. Um, uh, I am pretty certain that many of you will have had conversations about um, uh, confidentiality in, in your schools with your medical staff, uh, with your house staff, with the heads of year and so on. Um, and if you are um, in the business of educating teenagers, the notion of Gillick competence and the notion of when you have to hold and, um, the, 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 the information from parents uh, or not um, is quite a knotty one. But the, uh, both the parents and the teachers and the girls all said, um, we want to know what this, how this works. We want to understand it. Um, and invariably, the, the, the girls would say, that it's not that we, want, we don't want anybody to tell you. Don't want, it's not that we want confidentiality so that nobody knows. What we want is reassurance about who will know and who won't. Um, and parents have said much the same thing, actually. So that we understand there'll be things that you, you might hear that, that it, for the good of my daughter, which, that you've, you're not going to share. Well, actually, it's so trivial, it's not worth sharing. But we don't want to know when, when are the, where are the lines? When will you tell us? How will you tell us? How will you have that conversation? Um, will, you, you know, will you just say what it is? I think that's Yorkshire parents. I don't like, call a spade a spade. If a child is... If a girl is, is self-harming, just tell me if my daughter's self-harming. Don't wrap it up. I want to know. So actually, in terms of moving the culture on, that was a really important and useful exercise in terms of facilitating conversation. Um, and then finally, again, all three constituencies, if you have parents, staff, child, 
all wanted the reassurance that, that people knew what they were doing. Um, and for us, that meant quite a lot of training. Uh, we trained, so all of our staff were trained to, uh, by Compass Buzz to at least Compass Buzz Level 1 mental health training. All of our pastoral staff at Level 3. Um, and we renew that training every year so that we know that we have the confidence to have those conversations and that the parents and the girls know that we have that too. <coughs> so there has been an investment in training, but it's been very much worth it because actually it's also helped staff to help each other. Um, and for uh, middle leaders and for colleagues and the staff um, can take, you know, take, take issues on themselves. You know, they support each other in a much more informed way as a result of that kind of mental health. <laughs> So, in terms of our multi-layered approach, we started with our, our girls, our staff, our parents, there are some of the layers. And then we looked at our structures in the school. Um, where can we put in support? Where can we promote positive well-being? Uh, might that be in an activity? Might that be in our house routines? Might that be um, in PSHE? Lots of different layers within that. Um, but ask ourselves these four questions. The first one is, it's probably worth, if you want to go back and work on this or think about it now, um, what are the benefits of what we're going to be doing? Who benefits? How do they benefit? <coughs> Who? Um, so who is going to be involved? Who is going to benefit? How are they going to benefit? Who's going to be leading this? Who's going to be overseeing training? Who's going to be... Um, the, the mental health ambassadors in your school. Um, and I, and the, the first place to think about it, um, outside of your senior leader, are the girls, the, the, the young people. Um, we set up um, mental health ambassadors. So they would train at a six week training program. They volunteered to do it. Um, and they um, had six weeks of training from us um, in order to be advocates within their year groups. For mental health, good mental health, and they fed into an emotion to a, a well being, a deputy head girl well being, and a well being council. Um, but part of their training was clearly about safeguarding and passing things on, but also just understanding the languages of mental health. So, who? How? Talks about the training. And then what? So, what is it I'm trying to achieve? How am I going to do it? And then what am I going to do afterwards? How am I going to evaluate it? Because it has to keep evaluating and moving on, as I said. So um, for us, we um, ended up, this is a, something that we picked up particularly in, in lockdown, but we've carried on with it. So we uh, had a process <coughs> to positive well-being. So five things that we asked the girls to, to try and do uh, actually, this, if you read it, you can't see, I know, but if you see it, it's all about lockdown things. It's sort of things that you can do while you're at home, but it is completely relevant to, to, to current schooling. Um, and they're there. Connect, take notice, give, be active and learn. These five things. And it made it very easy to think about how assemblies might be um, structured in that way. Uh, we have chapels every week as well, so to working with the chaplain to make sure that, that there was a con consistency there. So uh, the chaplain I might go, I might say to the chaplain well, this week, actually, I'm going to be doing a connect this week, chappers, and he'll say, well, okay then, Sue, I think I'll build on that. Or he might say, right, I'm going to do be active. But we have that, that sense of five things um, that sum up everything else we learned. Um, and in this um, document, we gave them ideas of things that they could do. Um, but we, they are still at the heart of everything we talk about because they, um, giving is, makes you feel so good. And gratitude, we talk quite a lot about gratitude. And I think, again, in an independent um, sector context, actually having, being grateful and having gratitude and connecting with others is so, so, so important. And then, of course, there's the uh, support when needed. So I've talked about it already, but we have a wellbeing council um, meets once every half term, has a representative of all year groups in that council, um, and a deputy head girl, head girl wellbeing. She leads that group with my um, pastoral deputy, 
um, overseeing all of that, but they very, that's very much the focus. You can go, you can talk through there um, upwards as well as sideways. Um, the Wellbeing Champions Initiative um, and the sort of units that we, we included in our training were the role of wellbeing champion, safeguarding active listening skills. So actually really good skills for life in a six week program. And again, I think you can do that at any level age group, really. Just it, it, it's easy to target at the age groups that, that are safe, relevant to you. Um, mental health training, we say we use Compass Buzz for everybody. Um, and we've just um, got, we've got an inset day in November and we're going to um, roll that out now to our um, housekeeping and catering staff as well. That's the next phase of that mental health training. And then the obvious things, counsellor and wellbeing hub. We've got a counsellor in school every day, um, more if we need her. We've got uh, school nurses. We have a wellbeing centre. You know, some schools will have a, 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 you know, a quiet room, a place that they, you know, where, where, where children can just decompress or just spend some time. That can be quite interesting from a safeguarding point of view, just getting that absolutely right. Because um, uh, it can't be too out of the way, but it needs to be somewhere where they can feel safe as well. Some people um, uh, formally or informally have their dog, have dogs around as well. We're a countryside school, there are a few dogs on site. So every now and then a, a dog walk might be just exactly what a child needs actually, just to walk the dog. Um, and then the culture. Uh, mentioned this, the bottom one already actually. We talk a lot about, ask someone if they're okay more than once. Never just take the, yeah, I'm fine. Because if you're asking, it's because you care. So if you, so we say to the girls, well, if you know, if someone asks you, it's a bit irritating, it's because they just really want to know. So always ask more than once. And I think really for the um, whole school, uh, I am a huge tea drinker. Um, there's always time for one more cup of tea. There is always time for that, not, and a sit down in another cup, if that's going to make a difference. And that's the cultural change. You, know, you it isn't you're never too busy and sometimes um you, you know how it is children are kind of just swing past your study um, and you can hear them like, you hear them giggling outside or you hear the footsteps and the footsteps stop and you know it's a child's footsteps because they can the staff and drag them. um but the, the they, when they stop and you can oh, what's that you put your head around the door and oh, we were just wondering if the, i've got a basket of joy it's basically haribo and large mouth we were just wondering if the basket of joy there. Yes, come in, have, have some, have, have some, have some, have some. Yeah, you're all right. It's good to see you. Oh, and no, I've just come off the hockey pitch. I'm absolutely exhausted. Oh, well, well done. That's great. I, I heard you won. Or, yeah, no, I'm all right. It just, well, what, what was, what's that all about then? Or, look, I've got a cup of tea. Why don't you just sit down for a minute? And that happens in heads of year offices, happens in deputy heads offices. In boarding house studies, you know, the house studies, there's fruit and Haribo, because we're healthy, but um, there is that still that moment, and you and it's reading the rooms of your school. Can you hear the footstep? What's the footstep like? Um, is it a giggle because they just think they're going to get some free Haribo if they ask nicely, or is there something else? Or sometimes it's the giggly girl with the quiet friend. So, uh, one more cup of tea, always important. But it, you have it in school, <laughs> this is where the tea is. Um, and for staff, it's really important too, actually. Um, that notion, um, we don't have time as leaders, not really. I'd love to read all the books. <laughs> yeah, I've read some, not many. I've got some on my shelf I've never read. Time is of the essence, but um, if it's in a school where well-being is the embedded culture, um, the person is the most important thing. And you lead by example as that person, including um, I do actually need to walk around the grounds now. I am going to take myself off home because I, I feel myself getting really prickly and I'm going to say something I regret. That's good with emotional well-being too. And finally, what do we need to remember? Well, teenage life still goes on. This is not about... Um, your hope, like homework deadlines are giving me anxiety. It's like anxiety is like a disease. Mm -hmm. And you must hear this. <laughs> so, particularly teenage going, it's just too much. I'm just, it's, it's my anxiety, it's too much my anxiety. I can't attend, as, as this is one of my classics at the minute. I've got a couple of year 11 girls 
who are trying to convince me that they can't come to assembly anymore because it makes them too anxious. Um, and the job in a school where emotional well-being is important is to work out what that is. Is that anxiety? Is that year 11 girls who just would rather sit in their room and have a chat? Or is that something else? Or is it actually that my assemblies are so rubbish that I need to do something about it? But, um, <coughs> sir, this is not good for my mental health. No, but it's really good for your GCSE maths. <laughs> so on you go. So we still have that, and it is doing that balance, which is, I suppose, the final part of that, because you can get dragged into the kind of, the, you know, it's all, all about anxiety and mental health, and actually it's about just happy children doing the things they need to do. And life can be a bit, you know, sometimes it is GCSE now. So, courage staff to notice, attendance. If you don't track attendance, and we all should, inspection-wise, but if you um, track attendance, really closely particularly in a secondary environment where they're moving between classrooms a lot um just see if they're always not quite on time for particular lessons if they are slow to change for sport if they're quick to change for sport but actually <coughs> attendance and punctuality is quite interesting in terms of a barometer of mental health um parents are unable to explain the behavior of their child I just don't know what's going on with her at the minute um or frequently calling out minor issues in the in my experience parents who are always on the blower or on the email um, and telling you know about every single little thing drive us mad underneath it there is something they're really worried about and they don't know how to say it and they don't know what it is there's very few of course there's one or two that would just want to cause you trouble but actually i think 97 percent of them there is something else going on and it may be something quite significant in the home actually that we don't you know, we're only really submitted with the iceberg but there will be something um also outsiders we know that children who just don't seem to vanish you know a newly outside or never seem to quite connect connection is so important a child with no apparent worries really some children are always are absolutely happy Certainly by teenage times, they should, there's, if they're telling you everything's all right the whole time, that's not. Um, and finally, share information. Um, it's amazing when the jigsaw comes together that you suddenly realise what you've got going, going on, positively as well. You know, this is, you've got a great year group, they're really motoring, why? Because all of these things are working really well for them, that's great, you need to know that, capture that. At the same time as seeing something not going well for, for a child and knowing why that is. And I suppose at the beginning, you may or may have not noticed my pomegranate. Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, looking after well-being in a school is a bit like having that pomegranate and opening it up. So the, you've got the hole, and inside you've got lots of treasure, but you've got lots of seeds as well. And you just need to be able to prise it apart and work out what's going on for good and see the whole as well. You see the whole, you see the inside, and, it, um, and all the possibilities that are in there as well for, for moving things on. So um, it's always a work in progress, um, pomegranates. But actually just having that sense of where your school is and getting able to take the temperature makes all the difference in the world with the themes um, and with the child-centered approach. Not rocket science, but that's how we've managed it at QF.